We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good afternoon. It's so nice to see you all, my colleagues, after almost two years of uh, online continuous cooperation that we had. So for the record, my name is Anya from the IGF Secretariat in my role as the focal point for the National Regional and Youth IGFs. And this is the traditional NRI's coordination session, an open work meeting that's happening between all the NRI's as well as uh, all interested stakeholders in the work of the NRI's. Its main goal is to understand what has been done so far and what needs to be done in the coming months and ne next year especially to have a stronger NRI's and with that stronger global internet governance ecosystem. A number of NRI's are present here in, uh, in the room physically and it's really a wonderful experience after such a long time. But I know that a bigger number of the NRI colleagues is present online. So special greetings goes from all of us to our colleagues that are present online. You are certainly missed that you're not here, but I hope that uh, next year we will have a really uh, large in-person mostly meeting for all the NRIs. Before we start, we have uh, in the next, I believe, a little bit less than um, 90 minutes, quite an interesting and uh, complex agenda. We are, I think, very fortunate uh, at this meeting to have with us to join Ms. Uh, Maria Francesca Spatolzano from the officer in charge of the Office of the Envoy of Technology. The title is very known to all of us. The Roadmap for Digital Cooperation from the Secretary General has been very important to the NRIs as well as the Internet Governance Forum overall. And uh, in fact, the NRI self-organized and even responded to the open consultations that were associated with the processes of the roadmap on digital cooperation and its implementation. So let me please give the floor to, to the tech envoy for the opening remarks, and then we'll proceed with our agenda. It's on, I think. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Communities of the Internet Governance Forum. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you in this important coordination session. And I've uh, uh, heard uh, in uh, these past months uh, many impressive, motivating stories about national, regional, and youth IGF from the fact that your origin is organic and grassroots to cases where national digital policies were changed as a result of NRI's message meetings and about how you collectively cooperate as a global network. And I had the pleasure also to be part of one NRI process myself, thanks to the kind invitation of the National IGF of Italy held a few weeks ago. So today, finally, I connect all this with persons and faces, and I'm here to, to listen to you. And it's a tr true honor for me. And as you know, the Secretary General Roadmap, as Anya was saying, for digital cooperation, calls for forging linkages between the IGF and then and, um, our eyes, sorry for the acronym. The, the Office of uh, the Secretary General's Tech Envoy, working alongside with other UN agencies, is tasked to coordinate the efforts to ensure that the roadmap is implemented. And now, with the Secretary General Common Agenda, we have broadened uh, uh, the horizon towards building a global digital compact in 2023. And the NRI's contribution is essential. I highlight this for you because I believe that the potential of bottom-up multi-stakeholder process at local level such uh, as yours is really important. These processes have proven to be critical 
for efforts towards making the internet more robust, resilient, secure, safe, affordable, and accessible for all people. The roadmap is also clear that its effective implementation depends on effective national level assessment and deployment. And in that regard, I hope that we can start expanding our relationship. And I invite you indeed to join the roadmaps implementation teams of champions and key constituents and to contribute your ideas in the process of building a uh, consensus around the core principles of the Digital Compact. And I invite you to keep us posted uh, about updates from your respective regions and communities in the same way as we do our best to keep you informed on our work. But I especially invite you to tell us what to do to ensure IGF processes in your countries and regions are strengthened, more effective, and uh, more present across all walks of society. I know my colleagues in the IGF Secretariat are at your disposal, of course, to hear ideas, work with you on implementation. And I would like to add that the Office of the Secretary General Envoy on Technology also stands ready to respond to your needs when and where possible in its own activities area. And I encourage you, finally, to focus on what concrete steps could be taken to have a more effective IGF ecosystem composed um, of uh, uh, many elements, and among these, a strong, sustainable, locally and globally recognized and supported NRIs. And I look forward to your very engaging dialogue about to happen. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, SG Spatosano. Firstly, for finding time to be here. But first of all, thank you for the continued support to the NRIs, which I think goes beyond uh, just being present at certain sessions. You are um, members of your team. Uh, I see that colleagues Jason and Yu Ping are here. They've been real, uh, very kind in uh, cooperating closely with, uh, with the NRIs uh, in regard to their processes, and they showed presence at their processes, which we very much appreciated. And that's how the good cooperation always starts. You have to know each other firstly to understand what you're doing, and then from there, uh, good action always starts. Thank you very much. I know you have a very busy schedule at uh, this year's IGF. We really appreciate your time that you're here. You're most welcome to stay as long as your schedule allows, of course. Uh, and, and at any time when you need to leave, please be free, be free to, to leave. We're a very practical group and with full understanding. And we will, uh, if you agree, move to the agenda that we all agreed. So the agenda for this session is agreed in a bottom-up manner by the NRIs over a number of virtual meetings since the beginning of this year. Uh, it was decided that this year's session will focus on discussing two major areas. The first one relates to overall sustainability of the NRIs. There are a couple of aspects we are going to discuss. The first one relates to financial sustainability. And I do think it's very important just because the processes that we're running, they're obviously very valuable, but they also come with, with a cost. And we need to understand from where the funding can come especially in regards to the international ecosystem and how can we all work together to uh, streamline that process. And then the second part of this session will relate to the work of the NRIs becoming more policy impactful, not necessarily at the local level, but I think also at the global level. And what the ASG Spatulisanos mentioned about the roadmap, that's one of the processes I think where the NRIs can play a very important role, noting that in some countries and regions still uh, an NRI process that exists is really the only opportunity to understand the, in a multi-stakeholder environment what the digital policy is about in terms of the priority for a local community. So with that, the format of this session obviously will be very open as we agreed, so it's uh, up to you to raise your hand and speak. Uh, I have a microphone that I can pass on uh, to all of you when you start speaking, and there is also this standing microphone here. And the ASG is kind to also uh, give us her microphone. So I think we'll manage to have a, a quick, uh, quick uh, action on this. 
Sustainability of the NRIs, that's our first area, and then I invite you to all to comment on that. The idea is to hopefully come up with some sort of an action plan for the next year that all the NRIs can work on, cooperate, and hopefully implement. How do you feel in terms of uh, your financial resources for your processes? I especially refer to the context of the pandemic and turning completely to online or, compl uh, or turning to hybrid meeting, which from the experience of the IGF can, be, can come with even higher costs than when you, when you speak about what was before a traditional on-site meeting. And I especially would like to, uh, you to put the emphasis on how the international community can maybe better support the NRIs, or are you already happy with uh, what is already there uh, in, the, in the presence? Let, let me just mention that there are a couple of outlets that are giving uh, grants to the NRIs, and there is a procedure that's established. So in that sense, the IGF Support Association, for example, does give grants to the developing uh, countries related processes for national and regional IGFs uh, with a certain amount of grant. I'm glad that Jennifer is also there, so she's also uh, carrying a hat of IGFSA and APR IGF coordinator. Uh, ISOC, ISOC Foundation as well. I think ICANN has been a very strong supporter of the NRIs. The IGF Secretariat, as you know, for the past two years has been giving uh, financial grants to the NRIs in developing countries. So that's also a mechanism, at least, that we know that uh, we can apply for. But obviously, it's not everything. And I think uh, developed countries related NRIs are also facing challenges because many of these resources that are known that exist in the international ecosystem are actually uh, in their eligibility criteria related to developing countries. And that's a little bit of a challenge uh, from the experience of, uh, I'll just speak from, the, from my experience as the NRI's focal point, especially for the regional IGFs, for example, where you have, um, so Eurodig is a very specific example, where you have um, covering Europe, where you have a number of developed countries, but then again, there are a number of developing countries. And so how do you differentiate there whether that regional IGF would be eligible or not for funding? It's been uh, a subject for a discussion with some processes. So with putting this on the table, uh, I invite you for all of us to, to brainstorm a bit and to understand how can we um, streamline a little bit better the uh, funding that's coming from the int international ecosystem. And then uh, we can move on to discussing about mobilizing the local community to support better the NRIs. So you can maybe uh, raise your hands. Uh, oh, I see we already have a raised hand. I would also want to invite our colleagues that are present online just to raise their hand. And I will be able to recognize them if uh, my dear colleagues in the back of the room would show maybe Zoom uh, in the, on these screens that are in front of me. Thank you. So maybe let's start from you. Thank you very much, Anya. I am Toko Nia, and from the Southern African country of South Africa. I think in terms of the NRIs in our areas, in our countries, and looking at financial um, solutions there, but more specifically looking at the COVID uh, context, um, and the current pandemic which we're in, uh, in Southern Africa, Africa, I can say our perspective is looking at digital infrastructure. So with addressing the issue of funding, we would essentially look first at the context of infrastructure and addressing the need of creating transformative, transparent digital infrastructure systems, which uh, either currently don't exist in many areas, especially rural areas, or are inaccessible um, particularly for African youth. Um, and so it, we do, I do believe, um, and uh, in terms of NRI structures, that when it comes to um, accessibility, uh, that would be the key focal area for there to be financial distribution to ensure that there is an equal, accessible, compliant, and transparent internet for all to provide strong support, to be able to create equal opportunity for bridging uh, technological skills gaps, which are significant in the Southern African countries, 
And due to the COVID uh, crisis, uh, the education and availability to education where schools were the primary often um, first point of contact with any technological um, device or education, uh, the pandemic and quarantine times broke that system, um, breaking in many cases, uh, including my own hometown where I'm from, complete access to education where for months there was absolutely no educational structure due to inability to access uh, resources. So definitely in terms of if we were to look at financial infrastructure, we would be looking at sustainable development towards digital infrastructure um, and to see how we would be able to coordinate um, transparently uh, a, a collaborative compliance towards funding um, NRIs and actually providing digital access to and access to the internet for all. Um, so in this sense, yes, I do believe that digital infrastructure would be the primary uh, focal point for us as Southern Africa in terms of uh, financial sustainability of NRIs um, and look forward to using this as the game changer to um, the development of, of internet and governance in Southern Africa. Well, thank you very much for sharing these points. Uh, maybe I'll invite you to comment also on these points and share your points as well. So yes, Michael, I'll give you my microphone maybe. Uh, good afternoon all. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. I know we've missed <coughs> meeting in this like manner in the last couple of, is it two years now? Uh, yes, two years, yeah. So basically to follow up, <coughs> to follow up on, uh, on the points raised by our sister from South Africa, when it comes to NRI funding and holding our, NRI, uh, our national IGF uh, meetings, it's been a challenge in the sense that if you look at the funding that we request for and activities that are involved in, in coordinating and uh, eventually holding a national IGF, it's, it's more expensive on the aspect of coordinating and also later on to talk about holding it. So basically I'll talk it, I'll speak it in, in two lines. The first one, I think there should be a condition that the NRI secretariat, uh, like the one you coordinate, in the sense that you should put in a law or a regulation that will only allow you to fund activities that do not span beyond September. Why am I trying to say this? Because we have situations where a country hosts their national IGF in January, another one hosts in December. How is the reporting process done? So if you put to say every NRI that needs to be funded must submit and hold their NRI before September to give chance to the regional IGF to take place and subsequently the, uh, the sub-regional one and subsequently the, the regional one and the global one. Because we can't have an NRI taking, a, a, a national IGF taking place post the, nation, the global IGF. Because to me that is a reporting structure uh, deficit in terms of why should a national one take place after the global one. So the second point is about funding, is about when we hold this online meeting. I know we've, we've been trying, this is the second year we've been trying to, to see how we'll perfect it. Now the issue comes in to those who want to participate in the Zoom space, in the online space. I'll give an example of Africa. Most people want to, to be reimbursed for their data that they've spent attending your meeting. How does an NRI, how does a national IGF able to fund or to, to buy data to those who are participating. At times you have a registered audience of about 80. By the time you are having your meeting, only three come online. Uh, last week we were supposed to have our Zambia National IGF. We had a couple of people who had registered, but because we had put it record straight that there will be no reinvestment of data used because it's, a national, it's of national interest. What happens, we start the meeting, only about 22 showed up, and yet people that had registered were more than 300. And according to our own plan, we say we can only start a meeting if at least 70 persons have, have registered and have come online. So we ended up just canceling. We don't know whether we hold our national IGF 2021 or we postpone it to next year. So basically, just to come back to the point, as much as we seek for funding, 
let the donors also look into the aspect of also funding the participants. As long as the meeting is taking place online, there are other participants who, who would want to be part of the meeting, but unfortunately they can't because they can't afford to, to use probably 500 MB or 1 GB for a one hour meeting, two hours meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Maybe I'll, I'll take it. And then I would like to give the word to Plantina, then to Liana. Thank you, colleagues. Um, I just must agree with Michael's point. Um, just to start off with, um, I'll indicate where the South African Internet Governance Forum gets its funding. We are funded by both the Department of Communications and Digital Technologies as well as by the .za domain name authorities. Those are the funders, but we do source uh, funding externally, and I must um, just applaud um, the IGF Secretariat because they have done their part to assist us financially in, in, in our funding. But I also just must come back to the point that was made by my colleague Michael. Um, there is an import, there's, there's value in putting up timelines as far as when um, we can have our IGF um, for funding purposes. So if we're going to have our IGF around the same timelines as the global IGF, it does not make sense because as far as my engagement with particularly you, Anya, is that um, I need to submit a report. So when do I submit an IGF report if I'm having an IGF meeting around the same timelines as the as, as, as the global IGF? So I must just... Um, but I think I'm, I'm glad that you made mention of ISOC, ICANN, and the global IGF, because I didn't know that those are funders. Uh, what we, we relied on were just um, what was... What we relied on for funding was just the department, the department itself, as well as organizational structures to fund. But now there is an awareness, which brings me to my second point. I think there needs to be greater awareness. Maybe it's just with me, but there needs to be greater awareness of where we can get our funding. It wasn't up, up until communication that I realized that, that this is where I can get funding for our national initiatives. And I think if I didn't know about it, there are a lot more colleagues that also didn't know about it. So they end up not having IGF meetings because of funding purposes. But I think maybe just increase awareness of what the channels are that we can get funding and which organizations and what the budget, what the limitations are for funding. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fontina. Uh, there's already a very concrete action point. Liana, before and before I give the floor to you, since I'm closer here, so I'll give them later. Um, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. My name is Nema Lugangira. I'm a member of parliament from Tanzania. And one thing that I wanted to stress upon, I think it's important for whenever, you know, national IGFs are being organized to also remember to in extend invitations to members of parliament. Um, because at the end of the day, oftentimes, we as parliamentarians are not, um, are not included in discussions, and that's where decisions are made, and thereafter it is us parliamentarians who are then expected to be part and parcel of the process of making sure whatever that was agreed upon in our absence should actually be implemented. So I think it's very important for national IGFs to make sure that, you know, and to make extra efforts to ensure that parliamentarians are at those events, are involved and capacitated to understand you know, the different dynamics, uh, because at the end of the day, you know, all of the things that are being discussed end up needing legislators to take, um, to take some sort of positioning, et cetera. So I wanted to highlight the importance of parliamentarians, and personally, I'm very much grateful for the Tanzania IGF for ensuring that um, I myself am able to be here today, because prior, that was not there. So I'd like to highly commend um, my, our leader here from IGF, Nazar, for, for having an, ensured and facilitated that. Um, the other part which I wanted to echo is, my, is a colleague here who mentioned that um, because of COVID, it's so used of people coming on Zoom, but we tend to forget most of us in developing countries do not have budgets for being online. You know, it, it, it is almost assumed that, ah, oh, it's just a Zoom meeting, so, so 
so there is no budget for it. But in actual fact, you know, someone to be online, data is expensive in most developing countries. You know, if it's going to be an hour meeting, two hour meeting, sometimes three hour meeting, there needs to be a way at least to, you know, accommodate a certain amount for data. Because otherwise, what happens is people don't turn up. People don't show up. And it's almost being translated as it's kind of um, abusing people. Because people come online, you get people presenting, they prepare for those meetings, and they're not compensated. Whereas if they were coming to a physical meeting, they would be compensated. Because even if you're presenting online, you have to prepare material. You have to do all of that. So I think it's very important to ensure that we recognize the time and effort spent and compensate it accordingly. Otherwise, you know, things like either you won't get the right people to the meetings, so then the discussion you know, does not end up being what it was intended, or you end up not having anybody to the meetings. And then it becomes even further, further detrimental. Um, the final thing that I wanted to touch on is, at least with the experience of Tanzania, we didn't go through lockdown. Um, but when our schools closed, we got a, I personally recognize a huge impact of rural connectivity, because most of our schools are not connected to ICT. Um, which meant, though we did not have lockdown, when public schools closed, those students in public schools did not learn. They didn't learn anything. So um, as we're taking further this discussion of you know, national IGFs, we also need to recognize what interventions can we do in the communities that COVID has shown us. So there could be a collective effort towards you know, promoting and strengthening ICT in schools, for example. You know, those tangible things that will really become helpful um, to communities in the, in the developing sector. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity. Asante Nsana. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for being here. I wish more parliamentarians could actually be. Hope that uh, the NRI's main session will be attended indeed by the parliamentarians uh, that participate in the parliamentary track of the IGF 2021. But so many important points you've raised, and uh, I certainly would like to comment on them, but I want to give opportunity firstly to the NRI colleagues. But I, I do want to just remind, uh, especially on the important point of, indeed, engagement of the parliamentarians as decision makers uh, in the NRI processes, that I believe the network is, to a very good extent, aware of that. It's very challenging, but we are seeing progress in that regard. Beginning of this year, one of the objectives for the NRIs was to produce a mechanism in a collaborative and a consultative way how the parliamentarians and uh, overall the governments as well can be more engaged in the NRI processes. We uh, managed, and I thank you so much for that, we managed to produce a brochure that explains, I think, very practically in a simple way how can that be done. It's translated to 10 different languages, thanks to you and your voluntary uh, com commitment in that regard. And it's already showing results. I don't know if our colleague Osvaldo is here, I don't see him, but he will be the one who is going to speak about the concrete results. And a number of parliamentarians from the Dominican Republic are actually here, thanks to what Osvaldo told me after reading that, that brochure and understanding a little bit better the, the engagement mechanisms. So with that, let me, uh, I believe I said Liana, and then I know there are a couple of colleagues here, so I'll ask Liana. You have to distribute the microphone. Thank you. Thank you, Anya. It's really a pleasure being here. Uh, Liana Galstian, Armenia IGF. Um, I also would like to uh, reflect on the discussions and the points that have been raised by our Tanzanian uh, colleague uh, on the involvement of uh, par parliamentarians. And I want to stress that we also uh, invite members in Armenia. And I'm very happy that we, um, the member of parliament, are being involved in the discussion discussions and uh, they are present at the uh, national IGFs, uh, truly uh, their participation and that legislative power that they have is very important to the issues that have been raised at the IGF and globally. Uh, I mean, um, with all the community and all stakeholders being involved in that discussion. Um, I would like to, to go back to what Michael uh, said about the uh, timeline uh, of national IGFs uh, and the, the planning of it. Of course, it's very important on a, to, to have the timeline. 
But on the other hand, I want to stress that all national IGFs, we've been telling this, that we are independent. And it's not necessarily, uh, of course, there is a logic that we need to kind of report and uh, bring the national dis discussion into regional one and then to the global. But nevertheless, all the countries, they have their own challenges and they have their own uh, timeline, their processes, their, their, their discussions. So you cannot, uh, it would be very good to, to tend to that, uh, to be before the global IGF. But nevertheless, we are independent and we need to respect that for all the countries. And since I have this opportunity, also I'd like to thank uh, our um, international sponsors. Truly, they, uh, they keep um, supporting uh, the efforts of developing countries and uh, make possible of these discussions. That is to say, it is the Internet Society, that's ICANN and IGFSA, and the local uh, registry operators, the, the REARS that we do. So we're in Europe, uh, so thanks to RIPE. This is, uh, their support means a lot, and um, based on that support, the financial support that we receive from them, we also can make the outreach among the uh, local um, sponsors um, and bring some interest, because we, we mention sometimes that we have this interest from the global sponsors, but uh, this is so important that we have the sustainability from the local space. So that these are the mainly uh, the, the points that I wanted to raise. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Liana. Yes, and then can, can I? I had also put my hand up. So yeah, I, yes, I yes. Said, no, please, go? please okay. go ahead. Thank you. Um, so, Bram, for the record, from Malawi. Um, so I wanted to comment on, I think, what Michael said and I think uh, Toko and, and, and a few guys. So the issue of uh, sponsorship, for example, I feel like there's a disconnect from, from the IGF Global Secretariat and then the regional secretariat bodies as well. Because if you speak to the AU, of the Africa Union, for example, um, and, and other NRIs in, in the building, they'll tell you that they got funding from PRIDA, um, you know, a perfect example. But you find that South Africa is not aware that they can access uh, this kind of funding within the, the Africa um, region itself. Um, so. I feel like maybe we need to synchronize our information and obviously share in terms of the opportunities that are happening within the region, uh, sub-region, um, in terms of the funding itself. Um, now, on the issue of the regional IGF, um, I, I, I also feel there's a, there's a disconnect. Um, I'll give a perfect example of the SADIC IGF, which is the Southern Africa uh, IGF. We have been following up um, some of us individually to, to say, can we have the uh, SADIC uh, regional IGF? Now, because it's housed within the Secretariat of the SADIC, we, we can only go you know, t this far t to follow up. I mean, maybe if it were coming from the global IGF Secretariat to push within those uh, regional offices and follow up and say, what's, what's the status uh, for this year's um, regional IGF? If you go back to the, to the same uh, Africa Union, uh, under the PRIDA program, I think um, uh, a few colleagues I see, uh, they're here. Um, when they were doing train, uh, train, 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 training the, the, the trainers, they have outlined clearly, I think Mary is part of uh, the program, to say, this is where you hold your national IGF at the African level. This is the region, or maybe the SADIC or West Africa. And then we have our own, uh, you know, Africa IGF, and then we go to the global. So those are already, you know, standardized. But I think pushing this information now to the NRIs so that they are aware, and, and obviously also the global IGF is aware, so that when you're saying we want to give you funding, you say no. At the AU level, it's been defined that you can only have your uh, national IGF on this date. So therefore, you have, you have surpassed. Um, will not be able to fund you. I think to cope with the reporting uh, criteria that was being mentioned. So I just wanted to comment on those. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bram. I think there were a couple of colleagues around you that wanted to speak. Alke and I see. Yes, exactly. And then, then we can move here and then to our do chat over this side. Um, mine is just a fast remark. Uh, I'm Pedro Lana from the Youth Like IGF. And about funding and the need to uh, spread the news about the possibilities of funding. This is a real good point because this was the first time that I believe it, we are the seventh, six or seventh edition, six. six, the sixth edition of the Youth Like IGF. It was the first time that we got funding. 
specifically for the UFLAC IGF, not part of another funding. Uh, we got it from the Internet Society. Well, it was not that much, but since the uh, youth NRIs have a different dynamic than uh, the other NRIs, the Global Forum, it was enough because the most important part on that is making those youth that are entering the system, that are being part of this capacity building efforts. We have an open course since last year uh, to get these initial steps inside the internet governance ecosystem. And having some small things to compensate them for their efforts is something that is really valuable so people can stay on this place. Like on the last open course uh, that we have the Youth Like IJF ambassadors, many of them uh, became uh, active part of the internet governance ecosystem today. Some of, the, of them are here on site in Poland. Some of them are organizing sessions. Some of them are part of uh, in their countries from the research institutions uh, or even the government. And it's based on this uh, small helps with funding that people can access, uh, this uh, youth NRIs can access. They just have to know about it because it was the first time actually that Internet Society gave uh, this, this funding to uh, youth NRI. NRI. Uh, at first, they didn't even know that they could provide us to them, but after it was informed to them, and uh, the IGF Secretariat, I believe Angel, helped us with that a lot. They provided us, provided that to us uh, swiftly, and it made a whole lot of difference uh, compared to what we had last year. So it's important to make these opportunities reach people who are organizing the youth and RIs around the world. Or the national or the regional ones. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think was it you, Auke, and then yes, we and then Jennifer. So let's finish this area and then we're gonna move here and coming back there. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Auke Auke Pals from the Netherlands, and um, I feel actually very sorry that there are still many funding issues in the Netherlands. We do have a consortium uh, based from the Ministry of Economic Affairs and SADN, the .NL registry, making this available. Um, but what I personally struggled with is the last two years is the engagement. And uh, because we couldn't see each other, events were canceled. Um, okay, I'm doing it like this for the moment. Um, and what we struggled or what I struggled with is the tiredness actually on sitting on the screen and mi missing the ability to network also. Uh, because on the one hand, you do have the knowledge sharing in a session, but part of that, and maybe even more important, is the networking after that on how to proceed after that. And the second part, yeah, we or actually I felt that that is the difficult part on engaging new people uh, because the contacts that you have, you keep in contact with and you know them. Um, but keeping uh, new people coming involved um, and organizing events online in the second year of COVID was ev yeah, really challenging. So we were happy to have a face-to-face event, luckily uh, before the Dutch government decided on another lockdown again. Um, but yeah, that made us feel energized again, and we are happy to be with some colleagues here in Poland. But unfortunately, 70% uh, dropped out because of, yeah, still the urge uh, or not to travel. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Auke. Maybe we can, yes, just pass the microphone. I'm just looking at Zoom. I promise to our colleagues in Zoom, we have quite a large number of uh, coordinators present. We will give the floor to colleagues in Zoom shortly after we uh, exhaust already uh, acknowledged hands here in the room. So yes, please, you have the floor. OK, thank you, Anja. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jose Fisaka. I am the general coordinator of JAD Youth IGF and focal point of Youth IGF Africa. So I'm raising an important point, which is concerning youth and NRIs, especially when it comes to organize annual like meetings how we can like promote youth engagement youth i mean uh, activities and how can we like support youth like this i mean uh, last we uh, i mean uh, notice that uh, national uh, igfs and youth are not like connected so there is like 
a problem, I mean, between the two structures. So how can we put the two of them together to work and help youth in terms of capacity building and everything else? Thank you. Thank you very much, Isaka. I think it's also a good question to raise today at 4 o'clock at the Global Youth IGF Summit. It's a very important question, and there will be, I think, important yeah. stakeholders there to hear yeah. about these issues. Uh, with that, yeah. wisdom, correct? And then I think Jennifer, then we'll Please come back to Emmanuel, and then, yes, we're going to come back here and go to our online participants. Yes, uh, thank you very much. My name is Wisdom, uh, Ghana, Youth IG, uh, Ghana IGF coordinator. Uh, a lot have been said. Uh, I'm not going to repeat that. But I'm just going to say what uh, Ghana is doing. Um, yes, we have the Ghana IGF, and then uh, very coordinated. But what we realize is that uh, for the past two years, uh, we are getting uh, uh, a, a, a lot of issues within Ghana, or I should say Africa. Uh, if you realize, the youth unemployment rate has doubled. And then uh, the youth are getting worried. And then one thing that we can uh, think of is uh, what we can use the internet to bridge that youth unemployment gap. And then uh, doing that, we have to think more of uh, technology, think more of internet, and how we can tackle some of the issues within some, some of the sectors that we have that can create jobs for this, this youth. So what we are doing in Ghana, uh, for example, is to um, look at the entire region and then uh, get youth coordinators for all the entire regions of Ghana. We have about 16 regions, so every region is going to have one youth coordinator and this coordinator is going to be linked to a university in that, uh, in that region, working with the youth. And then uh, this youth, uh, IGF, is kind of linked to the main uh, Ghana IGF, uh, wh which has almost all the stakeholders, including the telecom operators, uh, private organization, and all that and then working with the youth to see how we can bridge that gap and also to see how we can take some of this information to the grassroots at the regional level through the youth themselves, discussing and then trying to identify their issues for us to help them uh, solve it. So this is another, uh, another thing that we can look at to see how we can bridge that gap. Yes, so this is what I have for now. Thank you very much, Wisdom. I believe uh, also our ASG will need to leave. I know you have a scheduled appointment very soon. Once again, thank you very much for being here and for your words. I'll see you around this week. Thank you. And uh, we will continue. So Jennifer, please. Yes, you've been waiting a long time. Thank you, Anya. Um, Jennifer Chung from APRGF. Um, also, I will speak later on with another hat on uh, as IGFSA, but I do see Marcus um, in our Zoom room, and I see a lot of colleagues also in the Zoom room, so I want to make sure the hybrid format of, of our meeting is, is definitely you know, uh, still there. Um, first, with the APR IGF hat on, because Asia Pacific is, is a region that is so diverse, it's very difficult uh, already when we, before COVID, to have, uh, to reach out to the underserved community, to reach out to the stakeholders we want to bring in to internet governance uh, discussions. Then when we went into COVID, you know, now, now almost two years ago, it became very challenging because access is already a very, very, very big uh, problem or, or uh, um, topic in, in our region, and I'm sure in other regions too, but, I think many colleagues have brought up connectivity because now that it's Zoom, many, I suppose, in, in the more fortunate and more resourceful countries would assume this is quite easy. You stay at home or you'd be in a place you connect and that's it. But they forget that it's very difficult and specifically the underserved communities that do not already have connection find it even more difficult 
to be able to engage, and that's the first thing. So that's, that's when we're looking at last year, APR GF was fully virtual. The way we were spending the money and the way we were able to get the sponsorship and where we put the money was very interesting because it was quite obvious that people had connectivity problems and needed assistance there. And the second thing is, is a transcription. When you're not in a room with somebody or when you're not seeing their mouths move, it's very difficult also to understand what they're saying. And we've tried two different ways. Last year when we were fully virtual, we did use you know, a human transcription service, which was very, you know, very good because they were quite used to the internet governance terminology and I guess the people's names, and they were okay with that. This year we tried a new experiment and tried to use an AI service transcription. And that was very difficult in two ways that we didn't uh, anticipate. First, it was very difficult for them, the AI, to understand people speaking English as a second language. If that is not your first language, we are not speaking you know, any kind of standardized accent in English. It's very difficult for the AI to pick up what you're actually saying. And then there's another part where we are trying very much to make sure persons with disability are also able to join. So we made it a very big point to also include sign language transcription. And I understand that also is extremely, you know, it's, it's expenses that we have to put in and, and think about. Um, and I want to pick up on a point I think a few colleagues over here, especially from the youth initiatives, have pointed out. How do we engage new people in a time like this? And we are already quite Zoom fatigued. We are already right. Uh, a resource is, is very thin. How do we engage the stakeholders we really want to bring into the discussion? Because if we're having the same conversation with the same people in the same room, all the time. We will not be able to get the ideas we need. We'll not be able to bring in um, people we want to bring into the conversation. And it's extremely challenging to tell someone, here is something you should participate and engage in. But this is the only way you can do it right now. And it's not, it, it, it's very difficult to, to convince, especially young people, when they already have all their, their classes online, competing um, programs online, why should we also do this online thing for internet governance, which we're not quite, we don't really know what it is. We use the internet, but we don't know what is this policy making, what is the governance part of it. So we also had to redesign our capacity building at APRGF. So this year for the fellows, we included a stipend for the connectivity. We included um, a more, I guess, robust, uh, uh, program with the mentors where they had one-on-one -on -one small group uh, um, engagement uh, chats. It was a, kind of more like a, a weekly chat they had even like a month, a month and a half before the entire meeting so they can actually understand this is what's going to happen. These are the people who are already engaged in this community and would like you know, to guide you through like a mentor to make sure they feel included, to make sure they feel that, OK, this is a community I want to stay in, to, to engage new people and to keep new people. It's extremely challenging, especially when we are in virtual and, and hybrid meetings. So that's one hat on. And then I know a lot of colleagues were asking about the funding issue, so now I'm going to put the other hat on for IGFSA, um, and I see Marcus is also on, online as well, so uh, if anything I miss, uh, please do add in the chat or, or, or put it in the, um, you know, put your hand up. Uh, we, we try very much to, to, to work with the NRIs in uh, developing countries, uh, the developing world NRIs, because we know it's very difficult. We know that especially you don't really know if you're going to have the meeting, if you have the meeting, how this funding can be spent. I know the grants that we do provide is just you know, a part of what uh, is, is eventually used in the meetings. There is like, um, I guess, consideration about transcription. There's consideration about equipment costs, especially if you are a, uh, an NRI that's just starting up. This, for example, if this year is your first meeting, I think the Comoros IGF was working quite closely with with you know Anya, you at the IGF Secretariat. But they were asking us, you know, what about the criteria, the eligibility? Do we meet you know all these requirements so we can get funding? So we, we try very hard to do that. And I think there's query from I guess the youth IGF from Myanmar, they're trying to, you know, set up their first meeting and they were wondering, do we qualify uh, for this, you know, criteria of, of funding? 
And then lastly, I know a few colleagues from the African region has mentioned, you know, there's different sources of funding that come in everywhere. And I think it's very important to, to make this known to the NRI network. I can only speak, uh, I guess, on behalf of, uh, well, not on behalf of, I can only speak from the Asia Pacific standpoint. Um, I can definitely does do a lot of work in, in our region. ISOC definitely does a lot of work in our region. But the RIRs also do a lot of work in our region. So the for for Asia Pacific, it would be APNIC. And I'm sure, you know, for the rest of the regions like AFRINIC, LACNIC, RIPE NCC, um, Aaron, I'm sure they also do have their capacity building funding that they would would look into. I mean, I don't know the specifics for that, but it is worth looking into it. And then lastly, because I have one last hat for Dot Asia, um, we are a quote unquote, I guess, a regional um, generic top level domain. We also provide funding for for the CCTLDs in in our in our region. So in the Asia Pacific region, the one thing we did this year was to help the KRIGF, the Korean. Um, IGF, and we provided uh, support there, uh, both in terms of funding as well as in-kind support. So I really encourage co colleagues, you know, and our colleagues to share this information with Anya so we can all benefit from knowing where we can get funding. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jennifer. I know we have one intervention here, but I promised before to Emmanuel. While Emmanuel is getting ready, please allow me to give floor to Nigel Casimir, who is with us from the Caribbean region online. Unfortunately, uh, Nigel was supposed to be here in person, but he had to cancel his trip. Nigel, you have the floor. After that, we'll hear from Julian, because I see that you've been holding your <coughs> hands raised in Zoom for some time. And then we're going to come back to Emmanuel, and then we're coming to the side. Yes, I remember. Nigel, please. Thank you very much, Annie. I hope you all can hear me well. We can hear you well, yes. We can hear you. Excellent. Yes, um, I, I'm Nigel Kasmi from the Caribbean IGF. Um, of course, this would be a regional IGF, and we serve, I, I am associated with the Caribbean Telecommunications Union, which is an intergovernmental organization with 20 member countries in the Caribbean. And we serve as coordinator and, and kind of corporate home for the, um, the, the Caribbean IGF, and we've done so since 2005. Now, we usually have our meeting in August, and in terms of funding and sponsorship and sustainability and so on, over the years, we have had sponsorship from the internet organizations like ICANN, the regional red registries, the Internet Society, and so on, but also some of the larger um, internet orgs like your Google and Facebook and so on, and of course, the IGFSA. Uh, we've had like everyone else, you know, uh, physical meetings annually since, um, since be, of course, before COVID, but since 2020, for the last two years, we, we've been online only. And one of the things we did even before COVID, because of course we're dealing with islands um, and not everyone might be able to, 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 to travel to a physical meeting, we, we had incorporated regional participation even in the on-site meetings um, from, from before COVID. So going fully remote wasn't um, too much of a shock for us. Um, I think in terms of sustainability of the, the effort as well, it's useful to have a corporate home or secretariat for the, um, for the IGF. In our case in the Caribbean, the CTU has taken, the organization I'm with has taken that role and um, uh, one thing we noticed, though, is that the, there, are, there are different challenges for funding and sustainability for the regional uh, efforts and the national efforts. Uh, at, at, the, at the national levels, um, you might find that the, the regional organizations might not have as much funding available for each and every one of the islands that wants to have a, a national IGF, and they have to depend more on the local commercial uh, stakeholders like your telecommunications um, uh, service providers or the governments or the local CCTLD and, and so on. Uh, someone mentioned earlier that there should be some linkages and timing and so on between the, these NRIs and the global IGF, which, which I agree with. I think it's even more impo important though, 
that we have such coordination between the national IGFs and any regional and sub-regional IGFs, so such that we have um, information, data, linkages coming up from the national level into the regional level and so on, and then up to the global level uh, thereafter. An important thing for sustainability as well is that um, we need support resources for rapporteurship and record keeping, in addition to having a, a corporate home, because the corporate home helps you to accept and seek sponsorships and, and so on. Uh, in the CIGF as well, we know capacity building uh, sessions, and especially so when we were on site, you, you, you go to a particular country and, and hosting the meeting there, you have capacity building sessions such that you you enhance the capability of the of the locals in that in that particular case. Um, I think uh, Anya, uh, in terms of all the things that have been raised in terms of, of funding and, and sustainability, those are the points I I wanted to make. Noting especially that um, the challenges are different when you're looking at regional and 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 the national. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nigel. These were excellent points and I think very useful advice as you shared. I would like to give floor now to Julian, uh, our colleague from the Colombian IGF, and uh, maybe to Zaina to conclude with the Zoom interventions and then we're gonna come back to the room. I, I do understand that you would all like to speak. So uh, yes, Julian, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Anja, uh, for this opportunity to share with uh, you uh, about uh, our thoughts in sustainability of the NRIs uh, from the perspective of uh, Colombian IGF. Uh, we have been uh, uh, making uh, our uh, IGF, uh, local IGF, uh, and this year we had the uh, eight uh, uh, edition. And uh, we have been uh, getting support from the IGF Support Association, also from the Colombian uh, CCTLD.co uh, administrator, and, um, and financial support also from, from Google uh, uh, Colombia, and a lot of uh, in-kind support from many members of the IGF uh, universities, uh, private sector organizations, uh, government, the uh, Jude Observatory, and civil society organizations. Um, and uh, we have uh, received uh, also, as uh, Jennifer was mentioned, uh, the opportunity to get resources from the Internet Address uh, Register for Latin America, LACNIC, so uh, they have been very active and uh, promoting a lot of activities um, in, around uh, uh, internet governance uh, in the region and also open these opportunities for uh, national initiatives. Um, in our, that is related also to sustainability, I want to mention that our last uh, forum this year, um, even if we have a very nice attendance from more than uh, about 32 speakers, uh, we have less participation than uh, previous year, even if we make a, a, a great effort to bring people from the regions, not only from the major cities in Colombia, and also we include language uh, transcription in our meetings to uh, increase the, the audience. Uh, it has been a challenge to uh, uh, bring the, the meeting to more people and catch the audience. Uh, so we have to be uh, with uh, new initiatives. I'm uh, uh, listening carefully uh, from you colleagues about what we can do to increase the attention of other stakeholders, participate more actively in the discussions, and um, hopefully that uh, we, we need to find more um, strategies as we do with the work with the Secretariat in the Global IGF to participate in collaborative sessions from NRIs to bring uh, more tangible outputs from our discussions. So uh, try to uh, that way to, to bring back uh, more attention in the discussions and, uh, and have more tangible uh, outputs from, uh, from them. That will be our contribution. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian. Uh, given the time, I think we're going to mainly uh, focus on the first agenda item. But uh, with your permission and agreement, I think that that is fine because we can always continue online discussing the second point, which is about the NRIs becoming more policy impactful. I do think that you are already including those aspects in your remarks now, and I, of course, welcome those. But we're primarily then focusing on the sustainability of the NRIs relates to financial sustainability, but also other areas such as capacity development, uh, uh, such as um, stakeholder engagement and, uh, and similar concepts. Uh, so with that, uh, Emmanuel, uh, briefly then we'll go uh, to this, to my right side, and then we're going to come back again to Zoom. Thank you very much, Anya. So I'm Emmanuel Vitus from Togo, and I'll plead with you and the rest of the people in this room to take one minute or 10 seconds to remember our champion, Makan, because I think he's one of the people that we'll really miss in this meeting. So I'll plead with you, if you accept, we take the one minute just to remember the person he was for us. Yes, of course. Thank you, Manuel. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm going to talk about the independence, I mean, uh, or the sustainability of the national IGS, and I will take our, our case in Togo. So let me say there will not be independence. I mean, of, a lot of people have already mentioned independence of the IGF. There will not be independence if we don't have the financial you know, sustainability. Uh, in some countries, they say some stakeholders have taken the IGF, they have hijacked the IGF, is because they have the money. So I think it's something that we should uh, really start thinking of. And from our country, for example, we don't organize the IGF if we don't have a minimum guarantee of funding. So when we're talking about gender, let's say we're talking about organizing the IGF in January or organizing the IGF in June, there's not always um, that assurance of organizing IGF until at least one founder say, okay, this year we're gonna support you. It's like this year we have to wait for the Andesa to send an email and said, gentlemen, we had our, you have our support before we choose a date for the IGF. So I think those are some of the things that at least at the beginning of the year, we should actually have assurance, especially from the traditional Founders like the IGFSA, the Andesa, and the other groups that usually support our initiative. So it helps us or giving us that guarantee that yes, this year we'll hold our IGF. And the second point is also uh, what happened to the schools. Because looking at the regional level and the national level, the schools are the most expensive. The internal government schools are the most expensive, especially for the regions where people have to fly from one country to the other, stay in the hotel maybe for three days, for one week. So they are the most expensive, but I've noticed that in the process of the Secretariat, we don't have uh, anywhere where we place the school financially. So it's something that we should really look at because even the traditional funders like Andesa or even the ISOC Foundation, for example, they only support regional schools. So when it comes to the national schools, they don't. ICANN, uh, the same thing. ICANN will give you a technical support, as they call it, which is humans, I mean human resources. But there's no money, but we do need money for those schools because it's the only place where we are able to build the capacity of the people. Uh, we just observed one minute for Macan, but to be honest, when Macan uh, passed, it was a challenge because we're thinking about what to be the future of our initiative because he was a pillar and we all rely on him. But at the same time, we don't have the resources to train other people to actually fit the shoe. So it's very important that those schools, we are able to give a certain like amount of money or a certain sustainability in terms of financial sustainability and independence for those schools so that we can train those champions so that they can take over because 
Uh, today, in Africa, we talk about the youth. <laughs> it's difficult to mention the age. Because at the same time, the youth are the people, sometimes, working on the national IGF as well. So where did they fit in the IGF process? Because if we send an application to IGFSA, it's for the NRIs. But the youth IGFs are specific events where they discuss specific issues. So their budget, actually, we absorb their budget. We absorb the budget of the schools. And we absorb the national IGFs. And it's sometimes very difficult, very difficult even for getting volunteers, because nobody will volunteer. I mean, be a volunteer in a process where there's no money. You can't do anything, even if you have that, uh, how do you call it? Uh, you have that uh, passion. passion for it. Thank you. <laughs> you have that passion for it. It's difficult uh, to, to, to do it without a financial. So I'll plead with the Secretariat to look at where we place those initiatives, especially the youth IGF at the national level and the schools. So if we are applying for funding, we should know that if a country is organized those three events, even if it's the same period, we should know that those events require budgets so that they support it as well. Because in some countries like Togo, for example, the local stakeholders, we don't have the adherence yet. Like they are not really fully involved financially to support the process. So we rely only on the small budgets that come from the traditional funders. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Before we, um, if you're going to be brief, if not, I, I did promise that uh, this is the queue, but. Very brief. Be brief, yes. I'm Kosi from Benin IGF. I think it's important to clarify the process. Youth and national or regional IGF cannot be in competition. I propose we make the youth lead the capacity building process. We will make there another new people for our national IGF and regional IGF. And national and regional IGF will be concentrating on the challenge of national level or regional level. That is my proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kwasi. And thank you for being brief on a very important point. Yes, let's go like this toward the uh, Ucha and Nazar. And then we're going to go back to our own uh, Zoom participants. I think we have 15 minutes until the end, so need to wrap All up. right, I'll try to keep it brief because we're so passionate. Uh, we've all been going long. My name is Advocate Zanyue Taticia Sore. Oh, okay. Can I just? Okay. And I'm the chairperson of the South African Internet Governance Forum, but I think like many others, I wear many hats in the ecosystem. So I also work as an independent advisor to the communications um, authority of South Africa, where we look at consumer specific issues and tele, uh, telecommunications and broadcasting. And I also run a company that works in the static region and issues around digital access. And we work with a few governments. I think Michael, I've actually seen you in some Zambian meetings. Um, so I think just to be solution oriented, the first thing I believe we need to do is create minimum standards of compliance when it comes to how we disseminate information. So number one, ensuring that websites are present and we take this for granted, but we actually have um, uh, NRIs and even glo um, national IGFs that just don't have websites whatsoever and any presence. So then already we've got an issue of um, dissemination of information, but outside of that, what do we stand for? Wh who are we? We should be using these same platforms that we're promoting to spread the knowledge. So that's the first one. The second one is actually creating a compliance pack. So what does that look like? When it comes to funders, some IGFs don't have, or some forums don't even have, let's say, letterheads or even just a standard communication of letters to these funders that we're saying we don't have. Um, so, so it becomes, you know, you're not going to just have a phone call to a telco and ask them to give you something. There's a certain level of um, etiquette and a certain level of communication that should be, um, you know, things should be communicated in a particular manner. And then I think another one, you know, I've been hearing issues around, you know, we want face-to-face. -face. In Africa, honestly, even just going online is a privilege. 
Um, we're already facing issues of, you know, electricity, electricity um, shortages. And I'm going to use that word quite intentionally. And that's just not in the rural areas. That's like everywhere in the entire country. And very few people have generators and inverters. So the costs that are being um, spoken about are quite genuine. And I think sometimes, you know, when so we do a lot of work in rural communities. And when we get asked this, they say, well, people are online or they're on Facebook, whatever. The, the telcos actually have specific bundles just for um, social media. So you won't be able to connect to Zoom. There's just no money for that. Um, so for me, it's really saying, can we have minimum standards? Because what happens is, I mean, and I'll speak for ourselves, for example, you get elected in March, you come in, but now you still need to look at issues of what's the constitution? What's our corporate identity? So now for the first six months, instead of planning an actual IGF, you are now doing all the corporate identity issues, which is something we actually need to look at. And the last one, I think um, I'm, I'm the lady from South Pacific Asia, you mentioned something around um, accessibility and ensuring that when we do have these meetings, we are looking at the disabled community. I think that's excellent. But we also need to do that looking at the ITU standards for websites. Can you go onto website one? Are we looking at ensuring that um, people who are blind and deaf can use it navigation wise? All of the, there are standards that are there. It's not reinventing the wheel. So that's the first one. Second one, language is a massive barrier. Um, in Zambia, how many languages are in Zambia, Michael? 72 languages. South Africa, we've got 11 official languages. So we really need to look at the nuances of, and I'll speak from an African perspective because I can't speak from anywhere else. Um, these things are there. You put them, you, we make sure that those are the minimum standards that we have. Um, I'll keep it brief. I could go for days, but thank you so much for the opportunity. <laughs> thank you very much. That was very quick. She's our chairperson. <laughs> um, Thank you for that, Advocate Zanyue. Um, I also just want to speak to my colleague uh, from Malawi. I'm so glad that you mentioned the issue of regional initiatives, and I think we should just um, take up the, pla the opportunity just to speak because we don't, we can't have a regional initiative real, um, without a, a, a functioning secretariat. But also to speak to the issue of the independence of uh, national initiatives um, and pulling in what Michael spoke about, about the timelines that we need to have our IGFs. In order to respect the independence of the national initiatives, is it then possible for us to have a reporting mechanism, also drawing from what Advocate Zanyiwe just currently spoke about, to say, what is the bare minimum compliance standard? So if you can't, for instance, have your uh, national IGF on before September, in order to still qualify for funding, what is gonna be the reporting structure that will enable you to still apply for funding even though there is a deadline for when you have, because as uh, my colleague has just mentioned, there are a few challenges that we are still grappling with as uh, uh, national initiatives and regional initiatives. But to make sure that we comply with the global standard, what reporting mechanism, and this is maybe just a question that I'm throwing uh, to you specifically, Anya, what reporting mechanisms can we have in place um, to ensure that we still qualify for IGF even though we have it after the, uh, 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 the actual deadline and uh, we can still comply with the reporting uh, uh, structures that are in place? Thank you. Thank you very much, Plantina. I take note of the question. I can uh, address it later, but I would like to finally hear from Ucha. He's been holding his hand for some time. Thanks, Anya. It's uh, Ucha Sertoli from Georgia, Nigeria. Uh, just I uh, have to uh, highlight two points. Uh, from our point of view, I think we are producing some kind of service. That's why uh, branding stuff is very important. Even web page and all this stuff is quite important because you're inviting new generation, you're inviting people who are related with the internet, so they have very special requirements. Uh, about the uh, uh, parliament and, and the policy makers' involvement, we can share our last two years' experience uh, that we finally signed a memorandum of understanding when, uh, with our parliament members, especially from the committee of uh, policy making and uh, the sectoral economics. And uh, this uh, gave us uh, the different level of relations with our policy makers because even every legislation, every law, draft law, have to be 
uh, discussed in this committee. Right now we have partners in our, uh, as a stakeholder. So uh, they have to discuss, they have to get the flow, and they have to use IGF, Dialog as a platform for every new draft law. So maybe it could be interesting for uh, our uh, colleagues from you know, um, uh, Zanzibar, sorry, if I'm, Tanzania, sorry, 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 my friend. And uh, finally, about the funding, um, about the funding, uh, yes, every uh, IGF has problems, issues, maybe challenges of the funding. So we're trying to invite uh, private sector and uh, give some opportunities. Uh, not big telcos, maybe not big. Uh, it's also up to us. We try to find uh, people who, uh, not uh, companies who have good so understanding of social importance of the internet governance. And this also gives uh, funding for networking, for uh, have some fun because we are using uh, iStars funding for uh, translation, for venue, but uh, for networking is a very important part of the uh, IGF meetings. We are using uh, private sector funding. Very brief, thanks. Thank you very much, Ucha. I think Nazar requested the floor first, and then we'll go to Mary. I, I yes. or Roberto, yes, or then, okay, we'll finish with this line, but then I would like to go back to Zoom after we finish this first round. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Naza from Tanzania IGF, and uh, I'm glad to be here with uh, all of you. Um, I would like uh, to make my contribution in terms of uh, what we have been doing in Tanzania. Uh, number one, Point number one is on the uh, sustainability of the NRIs. Um, I would like to look at uh, this uh, from two uh, or three perspectives. One is uh, we really have to be uh, to look at it from strategic and uh, creative uh, way of uh, doing this stuff. Um, I'm saying this because uh, there is uh, one, one guy who was uh, um, joking me and saying, uh, but uh, you're asking for funding, but uh, I think you are just uh, a debating society. I mean, I mean, what tangibly are you doing? And I said, uh, we are doing things. Um, so we, we really have to, to, to apply strategic and uh, creative thinking in uh, when we are doing uh, our, our, our activities. For example, uh, in Tanzania, uh, what we have done uh, so that we can bring uh, some things on the table, we have started uh, something called uh, Women and uh, Youth Innovation Hubs. And basically, what these hubs are going to do and they are doing, uh, they are addressing the issue of uh, connectivity, number one. Number two, they are addressing the issue of uh, innovation space, especially for young people. And uh, number three, we are also uh, addressing the issues of um, uh, using the indigenous uh, knowledge to solve our own problems. For example, on the issue of uh, climate uh, change, uh, we are using the, the, the local language, I mean the local uh, knowledge to be able to, to take climate actions on, on, on those areas. So you can see I embraced uh, with a lot of local content uh, from Tanzania because uh, we believe indigenous knowledge is very important. Uh, secondly, uh, on the issue of capacity development, I think I am looking at it uh, from two levels. Number one, uh, it is at the national level. Uh, and number two, it is at the uh, global level in terms of uh, resources and human resources. Um, from national perspective, what we are thinking is that uh, um, is to brand our national IGF in terms of what is it that we are doing. And uh, we are doing that process through engagement. Uh, you can see uh, member of members, uh, one of members of parliament, uh, 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 Ms. Uh, Neema Lugangira, is here. 
because we believe that if we engage and, and we brand uh, ourselves in terms of what we are doing, I think uh, we will have a lot of traction and people will, you know, will, um, will continue to, uh, to, to bring fund for, for, for the schools and for the, for the IGF itself and for youth IGF because we started uh, the youth IGF uh, this year. Uh, on the monetary side of resources, I think um, the, the monetary resources uh, part of uh, you know, creating capacity for the NRIs is very important. And uh, I think on the IGF portal, there needs to be a number of uh, probably links or whatever um, uh, funders that are interested to fund the the NRI's initiatives to be able to to be accessible. Some uh, you might find uh, maybe some some uh, funders are interested to to fund uh, the NRI's, but the NRI's are not aware of that. Uh, for example, I didn't know if Prida does provide uh, funding for the IGF. And, uh, you know, ironically, I am also part of Prida uh, <laughs> trainer. So, so it's, I don't know if it is uh, my own ignorance or is it, uh, uh, maybe I will have to find out. But I think uh, that, that is very important. Branding of our initiatives is very important uh, because, uh, like, uh, that guy was joking about uh, the debating society, the school debating society, because what we do here is, is talk about policy and all, all that issue. Third point is on the, on the issue of uh, policy, uh, uh, on the agenda of policy, I think. You were talking about yes. policy. Yes. Uh, we, in Tanzania, we're going to create um, the parliamentary caucus on uh, internet governance. And that one will engage not only the, the members of parliament, but also the technocrats from the government. Because uh, the technocrats from the government, they, you know, work together with the members of parliament in the, in the process of creating a, 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 any policy. So I think with um, a parliamentary caucus uh, on uh, internet governance, uh, we will have uh, solved a lot of challenges on the policy debates and, and policy you know, processes. Um, I think for now, let me end there because of, of time, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nazar, for raising these important points. Uh, was it that Roberto wanted to speak? After Roberto, or well, yes, and then after Roberto, colleagues are warning me we have five minutes, but I would like to... Uh, here very briefly from our online colleagues studying fro with Tijani is waiting for some time in Zoom and then I think we have a couple of other raised hands. So let's start with Roberto. I'm going to Zoom. We'll see if we have uh, enough time to hear other comments. Thank you here. very much, Anja. And good afternoon, good morning to everyone. I will just uh, would like to comment about the second point, which is how to make our uh, work more in policy impactful, Anja, which is very important, I think. In, in, our, in our country, in Bolivia, and I think in most of other countries, we were listening during the last uh, three events that we have, our last three IGFs, different perspectives and solutions and ideas coming from the panelists and also coming from the participants in order to overcome, let's say, just an example one, which is how to achieve the universal access and meaningful connectivity. It's present from the first IGF and it was continuing to the last one that we have last year. As uh, sometime I mentioned before, we tried to come up with a different format. We came up with a reversed or inverted panel last year. It was really good because we uh, had a more engaging session. But again, listening a lot of suggestions, very good ideas. For this time, in our last IGF in November, a couple of weeks before, we wanted to do something different. We wanted to actually provide some particular outcome, and that's what we did in this. We started a different uh, format now. We called a uh, policy proposal workshop, and in this time, we prepared for a couple of weeks prior to our IGF, we prepared a draft document, 
I'm talking about just one session because we did it in three among eight sessions that we organized it. And in this one, the one that I was moderating, we um, prepared a document, a draft document, with different ideas and also with the conclusions that we have from previous IGFs, last three years. And uh, with that document, we started by uh, presenting a summary of all the discussions we have before and presented the draft document to all the participants. And during an hour, we listened to different suggestions for adjustment or for additions to the document. And finally, we finished with, uh, uh, we're about to finish because we have it published in our website and it's going to be published for uh, some days more. And the idea is to have a concrete document that we're going to share, that we're going to send officially to different stakeholders, particularly to the offices and agencies of Bolivian government. And I think that's a very good way to come up with some policy impactful that we're going to That's what I wanted to share. Thank and you. Very Angela. valuable. Thank you very much, Roberto. On this particular point of the uh, NRIs being policy impactful, we are going to discuss this, I think, continue discussing this in an online environment. It's a very important area, and obviously there's a lot of material to be shared as good practices from the NRI colleagues. I know our time is up, so I'll try to be very brief, but uh, I think we really have to hear from our colleagues in Zoom. So I would like to give floor to, to Tijani, please, to uh, address all of us. Uh, thank you very much, Anija Tijani, speaking from Tunisia. I am the chair of the North African IGF, the MAG. So um, uh, I'd like to note that for sustainability, the Secretariat is one of the elements of sustainability of these uh, initiatives. And we are lucky to have the Tunisian Internet Agency to secure this function uh, 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 neutrally, very important, neutrally. They don't intervene in anything, but they are doing all the secretary function uh, uh, with no, no money, no, we are not paying for it. Uh, as for the, the, the funding, I have to note the, the, the IGF support and the ISOC Foundation support for this year. We had other support before, but this year only these two uh, uh, helped us. We just concluded our uh, North African IGF and North African uh, SIG uh, um, uh, now, and um, uh, it was in hybrid mode. I, I can tell you that it is a little bit complicated, but we managed to do it uh, thanks to the support of these two uh, organizations and of the uh, host country, which was Mauritania. Uh, 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 an important thing that uh, nobody spoke about, which is uh, the, the harmonization of the calendar for the NRIs. I think that the, uh, the IGF Secretariat should create a, a dashboard uh, on which uh, uh, it puts uh, uh, all, the, all the events related to internet governance of the year, and uh, they update it uh, continuously. And on this dashboard, each uh, NRI put their project, their uh, their dates that that they want to to help to hold their uh, their, uh, uh, their meetings. So I think this is an important thing because we don't have to have conflict. Uh, uh, improve communication, yes, of course, yes, we have to improve communication. So there is a big problem of communication, I think, between us and also between us and the. The, the global IGF. Uh, what else? Uh, uh, okay, I will stop here. I know that you, we are short of time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tijani, and thank you for being very patient. Colleagues told me that there is a really red alarm that in three minutes we have to conclude. That was probably said before a minute. So uh, if you agree, because our colleague Andrea Becali has been waiting in Zoom for some time, and I know a number of colleagues in this room are waiting, I think uh, let's at least conclude with Zoom, maybe to give uh, the final words to Andrea. Uh, Jenna posted very valuable comments in the chat, and I encourage everyone to connect to Zoom and see the comments, and I will certainly communicate that to the mailing list as well. But Andrea, if you could be please brief to address us all. Hello, everyone. I'll, I'll try to be as brief as I can. It's great to see you on video. Unfortunately, I'm not there, but I really congratulate and commend all those of you that uh, made the effort to travel to face all the burdens. And I heard also the very harsh weather. 
um, to be there in person. I think it's a very important um, message that you send with your presence to the uh, GF community and really you know, appreciate that for, for, for doing that. I wanted just to share very few um, remarks about the Italian AGF, which uh, I think will, could be helpful for the NRI community. I don't have time to go into details, so I only answered the first of the two questions, which is the sustainability of NRIs. And I hope there will be chances also through in the list to share more about uh, the other points. And I think the, that could be useful learning for the rest of the community. On sustainability, I think the Italian IGF found a very successful model uh, for the um, second year in a row. Uh, a model that in a way surprised many of us um, since for the first time the uh, Italian IGF and no real issues on um, resources, on funding. And this, this is not you know, usually, you know, this is, I'm, I personally work for ICANN and I, we've been supporting a lot of national IGFs. So I know that many initiatives, they, uh, you know, we, we heard even these sessions. And I think the good, um, the good lesson to learn is that the Italian IGF has been able to partner with um, local stakeholder community, in this case, the network of the Chamber of Commerce. And, and basically the Chamber of Commerce saw the, the powerful idea behind the National IGF. And they joined up bringing their own network and resources. And, um, and for the second year in a row, they organized the most success, we organized together the most successful IGF ever with numbers that uh, you know, can really compete with the global IGF, if not go larger than the global IGF. And um, of course, the Chamber of Commerce, they have their own views and agenda about the digital economy. And not always the governance model and the ideas and principles are, you know, in their plans. But it's been a good dialogue with them. You know, and one thing that I really encourage and I'm happy to share more to NRIs is to go venture um, and engage with other actors in your country that are you know, part of the digital economy or the digital policy making. And of course, in the private sector, I mean, we just saw in these two years how much the digital business boomed in a moment where all the rest of the industry were down. So the interest on the governance topic also on their part is as high as ever. So there are even more, um, there are even more elements for them to get interested. And at first, the principles of bottom-up, inclusivity, equal footing are hard to kind of, you know, to, it's not the easiest visitor card to introduce yourself. But once that you can show the powerful of getting on the same platforms, the ministers, policymakers, MEPs, it really interests the private sector. So, um, you know, we found that a very powerful alliance with the Chamber of Commerce will continue to do that. But, you know, we didn't sell the model to, to the Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber of Commerce saw the value and decided to support it. As I said, I can share more of those details. You know, the time is very short and I thank you for giving me the floor. And, um, and you know, I hope you will make this Global AGF very successful just being there. I think you're just doing that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, just by seeing this full room and uh, colleagues after two years, I think I'm confident in saying it's already successful. Thank you so much for being um, concise. There are so many hands in this room and also in Zoom, but unfortunately, we really don't have enough time. And I think people behind us would like to also have lunch. People need to stop the transcript. You would like to have lunch, which the host kindly provide, provided for free. So uh, I will let you go. But first, I would like to thank everyone. It's been a, a wonderful session full of inspiring ideas. I took uh, quite a lot of notes. 25 individual NRIs spoke at this session. and. Uh, Obviously, a lot of ideas are subject for further discussion uh, with the NRIs to see what concretely we can implement. But I think one of the uh, requests, obviously, from your side was to make more visible 
funding opportunities in the international ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And I will bring this uh, to the attention of my colleagues at the Secretariat. I think we can do this with, of course, the help of you to understand where the resources uh, are and make them visible maybe somewhere at the IGF website. Anya. Yes, please. Can you correct your funding opportunities to sustainable funding opportunities? Sustainable funding opportunities. Sustainable. Yes, I commit to use that terminology as of now. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here. And then, uh, final word, the reason why we moved this coordination session to the day zero, not to the last day of the IGF, is to really get to know each other better, and then hopefully have some spin-off bilateral meetings out of this session. And I do encourage you, really, to meet bilaterally. I hope that I can meet with some of you, if not all of you, bilaterally, and uh, to discuss a little bit more internally what's happening also from the side of the Secretariat. A couple of resources uh, are... I think emerging, it's good to discuss them. So we'll continue online our discussion and uh, bon appetit, have a good lunch. <laughs>